course provides clear guidelines on how to distinguish indoctrination from education. And that alone is a major service to all of us who are struggling to distinguish fact from fiction. And let me just, in introducing the topic of the war against boys, I like to quote Dr. Summers herself um, because she said, the war against boys, it is a women's issue. These boys are our sons. They are the people with whom our daughters will build their future. If our boys are in trouble, so are we all. So I know you'll be eager to hear from Dr. Summers herself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm not checking my email. I'm t keeping uh, track of the time because I intend to speak for about, there's a lot to talk about, so I'm going to speak for no more than 30 minutes, I hope less, and then we can open this up to discussion. Several years ago, a toy company, Hasbro Toys, decided to manufacture a dollhouse playhouse for boys and girls and for toy manufacturers to find a toy that will interest both boys and girls. Can you hear me in the back? Want me to be loud? To find a toy that will interest both boys and girls, it's kind of the holy grail of toy manufacturing. Uh, typically, toys are highly gendered, as the uh, scholars say. And, uh, but Hasbro thought maybe this structure would interest both sexes. The girls came in and played house, kissed the dolls, played with the baby buggy. The boys came in and catapulted the baby carriage from the roof. <laughs> And the Hasbro, this was in the Fun Lab in Providence, Rhode Island, the, the toy psychologist said, my goodness, they really are different. <laughs> well, <laughs> boys and girls are different. And one of the areas where this difference is most salient is in education. And in our schools today, if you look at how boys are performing and girls are performing, what you find is that it is, typically, it is girls who are winning all the prizes. Boys are the ones, they do distinguish in themselves, and the, they're most likely to get Fs and Ds, most likely to be ex, uh, suspended, to, to, to be thrown out of school, expelled. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, there is a gap now that's opened up with like, college attendance, favoring girls, that threatens to become a chasm. And if you look at, uh, there's now hardly any metric that you could imagine where you don't find girls moving ahead of boys. Now, this is not only an American problem. They're facing this in, throughout the world. Uh, that girls turn out to be better students. Now, it wouldn't matter that much if our economy had not changed so dramatically because there was a time where a young man uh, could do poorly in school, maybe uh, even drop out, but, but even get a high school diploma, certainly a high school diploma was enough. And then you worked hard, you could make it into the middle class. There has been a tectonic shift in the economy. And it is now, as everyone knows, no longer man as much an manufacturing based. Uh, we have moved into an information economy where education beyond high school is essential. It's the new passport to the middle class. And increasingly, girls are getting it and boys are not. Now, one, uh, places like the Brookings Institute and, and the Harvard Graduate School of Education, it's, it's almost as if there's a report a month to, to, commenting on, my goodness, what's happening to our young men? And at first, people said, well, it's really just the African American community, it's a problem of race. And then they said, well, it's in the Hispanic community, and that's a problem of, a special problem with Hispanics and the language. Well, it's working class boys. Now it's middle class boys. It is all boys. Now, of course, it, it, well, it, this is to say that it is across uh, all ethnic groups, across uh, racial class lines, uh, across the ability distribution, girls are doing considerably better than boys. Now, you may say, well, are they just smarter? Could it be that girls are just better? There, I have a few colleagues in, in among, I was a philosophy professor for many years, and I think I have a few colleagues in feminist philosophy that believe women are just better. And they had something called difference feminism, superiority feminism. 
There's no evidence of that. Girls and boys, on average, have the same IQ. Uh, boys, if anything, have a slight advantage because they are um, distributed a little differently. Uh, on a bell curve, you find more boys at the extreme of both tails. You find more male geniuses and more male anti-geniuses, if you will. Uh, so it's, it's a mix. But uh, on average, there's, there, there, it's not about intelligence. But boys do a approach the classroom differently, and it takes effort to engage them. It is much harder to interest a little boy in education. But here's the problem. At a time where education has been, never been more important, that was the moment where our educational system has moved so far away from the needs of boys. Our classrooms in America now are increasingly sedentary, risk-averse, non-competitive, um, and for little boys, increasingly feeling as if they are there on sufferance. And the other day, I was on a, sh a, a program, MSNBC, uh, it was, what was it called, the, the Cycle. And there were four people interviewing me, and I was trying to tell them about what was happening with boys, and they were having none of it. I don't think any of them agreed with me, and they said, a war on boys? What are you talking about? It's, think of all the men at the high echelons of business, and, and think of the wage gap, and um, maybe boys aren't doing well in school, but they're doing well in life, and you know, nothing is threatening the patriarchy. So I run into this a lot, where people will say, they, you know, let's, we don't have to be that worried because, uh, you know, they, as, as they said on MS, MSNBC, even if they're doing poorly, they will, they will move ahead as soon as they, they uh, graduate from, from high school. That's not happening anymore. And uh, there's an organization called Third Way, a nonpartisan think tank, which recently published a study documenting the downward trajectory of young men in America. And here's a quote from its two authors. These are two MIT economists, David Autor and, Autor and Melanie Wasserman. Quote, although a significant minority of males continue to reach the highest echelons of achievement in education and in the labor market, the median male is moving in the opposite direction. And then a few, a few months before, Brookings Institution uh, quantified the economic decline of that median male. Right now in the United States, for males 25 to 64 with, with no high school diploma, their earnings have declined 66% since 1969. For men with only a high school diploma, their earnings have declined 47%. Now, millions of male workers, according to the Brookings Institution, have been unhitched from the engine of growth. And as I said, boys from this is in all ethnic groups. If you look at the girls and the boys and you compare them, uh, what you find is that the girls are doing, uh, they feel more connected to school, they get better grades, and they have higher academic aspirations. There was an extraordinary study that just came out. Uh, three economists looked at the data on aspirations of high achieving students among our brightest boys, the A students there's been a dramatic change. It's not that they've gone down. There's been, you know, incremental minor change. And girls have gone like that. It's something like 30% of girls today say they want to go to graduate school. They're saying this in 10th or 11th grade. They don't just want to go to college. They want to go to graduate school. And with boys, it's 16%. I mean, a huge gap in aspiration among our high achievers. The number of boys getting A's compared to girls, the gap between them doubled. And why is this happening, and what can we do about it? Well, solutions. <laughs> um, several, I'll just tell a little story about my son. When he graduated high school a few years ago, his uh, class went on a camping trip in the desert, and they, he enjoyed it. But when he came home, he said there was one activity he really didn't like very much. This creativity facilitator or something had come to the camp, and as an activity, they were all given, uh, each child was given a notebook, a pencil, some matches, and a candle. And it was sort of dusk, and they were told to go a little bit into the distance of, of the desert and, 
and write down their feelings. They were told to find themselves. And so all the girls went and began to pour out their hearts, I don't know, about the stark loneliness of the desert or something. And the boys sort of gathered together and one by one sort of threw the notebooks into a little pile and then lit a fire, uh, the match, and made a little bonfire. And the, the facilitator, the creativity instructor, thought they were sociopaths or proto-arsonists or incipient criminals. I don't know. They were just little boys coping with an assignment that made no sense to them. To tell them to go and discover themselves in a, a sensitivity journal. Um, but increasingly, our classrooms, uh, there are sensitivity circles and the things the little boys like. The characteristic play of little boys everywhere for all time has been what is called rough and tumble play. Uh, there, now, this involves a lot of mock fighting, sound effects, boom, bang. Little girls do it too, but a lot less. For, for little girls, there are many, many ways they enjoy playing. Rough and tumble is just a small part of it. A lot of little girls, there's uh, imaginative theatrical play and turn-taking games or being with your best friend and exchanging confidences. You won't find boys doing that very often. If, if you let them outside, they want to engage in rough and tumble play. And with younger boys, preschool, kindergarten, there's a lot of theatrical uh, superhero play where they vanquish the enemy, and it's heroic play. Well, in our schools, increasingly, in, and in some of our homes, there's just no tolerance for the way little boys play. And I've, uh, I quote in, in my book and in the interviews I've had with experts on uh, early childhood education and playground dynamics, like Anthony Pellegrini at the University of Minnesota, who says that this is dangerous to little boys, this disapproval, and this interference with their play. He said that rough and tumble play is crucial to their socialization, also to their happiness. They enjoy it. And if, if school, the more school moves away and not allowing it at all, um, again, making boys uh, you know, more detached from school. What happened is that many teachers think that rough and tumble play is violence. And as Pellegrini and others have explained, it's the opposite of violence. Boys who are rough and tumbling uh, they are having a good time, they are smiling, they can't suppress their, their laughter and their happiness. Kids that are violent, it's very different. Violent children, there's anger, there's often tears, they part as enemies. Violent children are not usually not liked. Uh, a, a, a young boy who's great, rough and tumbler is popular. So, and then the superhero play. How many times do you hear in the news these days about a little boy, some hapless child thrown out of school, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, because he went bang, bang, or he threw a grenade at imaginary uh, bad guys um, to save the world. That was a little boy in, in, in Loveland, Colorado. It uh, was thrown out for that. We have lots of cases in Maryland and, and Virginia, all over, all the time. And uh, what's astonishing is this disapproval of their, their healthy, normative play. And what happens is that if you, if you make a child ashamed of his imagination, one father whose son was caught up in, these, in, in, in completely reckless application of the zero tolerance rule, he said, it's, if, it's as if they've criminalized my little boy's imagination. And I think that as a society, we may be guilty of that, of pathologizing the, the healthy, high-spirited play of little boy, the imaginative play, and not giving, making a place for it. And the, there were, uh, two, there's an excellent article by two teachers. I'm hoping that these uh, education researchers will come to the rescue. Uh, Mary Ellen Logue at the University of Maine, who, she studied boys' superhero play, and she's concerned, uh, and she quantified how many times teachers stop it, interfere. With girls, there's some interference, but relatively little compared to the boys. The boys, it's constant, it, it takes constant monitoring and interfering to get them to stop the rough and tumble play or stop the, the narrative play. And she says, you know, play is the basis of learning. And children, often they're imaginative, you know, their reveries, that they turns into their stories. 
and their drawings. And if we are coming down so hard on something that is so natural and, as I said, healthy and important, um, it, it's no surprise that we have little boys st starting out as early as preschool or, f or first grade, uh, liking school less, being less attached to school. And then you look at what, what assignments do we give? What's in the books? And uh, teachers, uh, especially in junior high and so forth, they like to assign a lot of fiction. Well, the British have done studies and shown that girls and boys don't like to read the same sorts of things. That you're much better off with a lot of boys giving them books about things or um, the Guinness Book of Records. That's a huge hit with many young boys, young men. And um, if you expect them to read, I remember my son had to read the Joy Luck Club in like ninth grade <laughs> about women and their self-esteem issues and struggling with their weight and their mothers and on and on. And he was, oh, well, I was baffled by it as well, but he, he was, uh, I couldn't believe someone would assign that to, I mean, at least give them some choices. Uh, but anyway, the, the, uh, the problem is that um, boys are falling behind and our schools are moving away from them. Now, the first thing I would urge is that we've got to, we have got to um, address this bias against boys. It's not only what I just described, the intolerance, but there's very good research now coming, and mostly from economists, not education uh, researchers, but economists who, who noticed something very odd. These were, this was a, a University of Georgia, two University of Georgia economists and a, a Columbia University economists, they noticed they had this huge uh, data sample of kids in 6th uh, uh, and 7th grade, and they noticed that uh, the boys, their knowledge of the subject matter was as good or better than the girls in science and a little behind the girls in English. But their grades were considerably lower than you would think based on, uh, this data set showed their aptitude in these subjects and it showed the grades. And they tried to figure out why do boys get grades so much lower than what they actually know? Why are they getting, you know, we can understand if they're misbehaving, they get poor grades in citizenship. But why are they getting poor grades in, in science and math and English and social studies? And what they found is that teachers factor in their behavior. And so if you have a kid who may, might be a superstar in, in science, or a little boy who just is the top reader or a top, a top uh, mathematician, but he's obstreperous and so forth, that we can all accept as parents that he should get marked down if he's wild. He should get marked down for citizenship. But we don't expect that he's going to get a lower grade in his math if he's the top student in the class and someone who's less able is getting a higher grade. We, most parents don't know that. They document this as going on in the classrooms they studied, uh, that this seems to be. So, uh, and then they found that teachers really uh, find boys difficult, that girls are more amenable to the classroom environment, and that boys are graded down. Now, some people said to me, well, why shouldn't they be graded down? I mean, you know, workers in, in the workplace, if they're lazy, and annoying, they're going to get in trouble. Why shouldn't we do it to boys? My answer to that is that we are talking about five and six, six, six year olds. We are talking about children. Um, and if this is going on, if they are doing something that is harmful to their, to their grades, then we should address it and figure out how to fix it. When we found out girls were behind in math and science and not taking sports at the same level as boys, there was a massive national effort. We passed the Gender Equity and Education Act in 1994, and girls were identified as an underserved population. Untor I mean, uh, absolutely uh, inconceivable numbers of programs, outreach, summer camps, you know, mentorships, everything to strengthen the girls. Why don't we do something now for the boys? Why don't we do something about the grade gap, the college attendance gap, the dropout gap? <coughs> now, other solutions besides uh, acknowledging, I'm keeping track here, acknowledging the bias, is to follow the example of the British. The British and the Australians and the Canadians, they all have uh, 
problems with their young men. The British call it ladism, what to do about the lads, and they're, they're rather desperate to solve this problem. And they have produced great you know, volumes of uh, pamphlets on what to do, and, and at, the, at the level of the British Parliament, there are um, reading lists on books that boys find irresistible and so forth. Why are the British doing this? Why are the Canadians and the Australians? Because they are worried about their economy. They see that large numbers of languishing boys as uh, an issue of, of national security. They worry about their future workforce. And they think that a country whose young men are falling behind is going to lose its edge. And I mean, today, in the United States, you would think we would have some effort with our colleges now um, if you look at associates of arts degrees, it's 57% women. Uh, BAs, 56, 57%. Uh, master's degrees, 59%. PhDs, it's 52%. Women have surpassed men for the first time, in, probably in history, in PhDs. And there's no end in sight. There's a, a statistician in Washington, he was only half kidding when he said, if these continue, if these you know, numbers continue in this direction. In the year 2068, the last male will graduate from college. Now, on some of our colleges, there are so many women uh, and so few men they, that admissions officers, at first they were a little concerned, then they were alarmed. Now they're panicked because if you are, if you are American University or University of Georgia, uh, Brandeis University, many, many universities that, are, you know, very, getting close to having only 39% men, that's the tipping point. If you go below 40, uh, then the girls don't want to come there because they'd like to have one date, you know, with four years in college. And uh, our, our campuses, many of them are beginning to look like retirement communities where you tend to have um, lots of women and a sort of small handful of surviving men. Um, now, we... So we have to think about this. We have to worry about this. And as I said, it is a crisis because of the of changing economy. And the outlook for these young men who do not get an education, there are millions of them who are insufficiently educated, is bleak. And there are more ramifications. Sociologists, policy analysts are just starting to figure out what is it going to mean if you have like, far better educated women and far fewer educated men. I mean, there's going to be a mismatch in terms of the marriage market. People tend to want to marry people of roughly the same education. And uh, one of the things, uh, uh, another alarming report that came from a group called Third Way, it's a, a fairly new think tank in Washington, D.C. that tries to bring uh, um, conservatives and liberal scholars together to work out solutions. And uh, they, they say that um, that young men are going to have a difficulty marrying, that they are not only not going to find jobs, but they aren't going to be able to form families. They will not marry, but they will still have children. So we will, it, it, and, and what they find, their, uh, their analysis is it's not just that we had a changing um, job market and we had a changing economy from manufacturing base to, to knowledge base. They think that the uh, fatherlessness that so many boys growing up without fathers has had a disparate impact on young men and their education. And they've got uh, very uh, powerful data just showing that like single mothers with children invest more in the daughters. And the daughters see they have the role model of the mother working and they become super achievers. The boys go in the opposite direction. And so they are warning that we're, we're starting this cycle of, of a kind of downward cycle for young men. We see it, it before our eyes. So as it becomes urgent to address the needs of boys, um, the British, the Canadians, the Australians, they're experimenting with more single sex classes. They are bringing in experts to find out um, how do you get a little boy to be interested in what you're saying. And it turns out you need to have a more active class, typically. This is not all boys. I'm not, I'm not talking about the exception. I'm talking about the rule. 
as a rule, has to be lively. There's humor and a teacher that likes boys. And a lot of boys think their teacher doesn't like them. And we've got other data to suggest that maybe they don't. <laughs> so, um, so we have to address that. Um, one thing that I found very impressive uh, as a solution was a, a, a teacher in Montreal. She's a professor, I have to look up her name, Sumitra Rajagopalan. She's an adjunct uh, professor of biomechanics at McGill. And she developed a program for disengaged teenage boys in Montreal, where one in three boys drops out of high school. Um, now, she brought these young men together and found that they were completely bored, bored out of their minds by school. They just didn't feel it had anything to do with the real world. But what really shocked her was how starved these boys were for hands-on activity. This professor discovered that these boys had never held a hammer or a screwdriver before. They had never touched tools. And, and she said, with so many boys growing up without fathers and schools largely staffed by women, she believes that as a society we have forgotten this special affinity of boys and tools. So under her supervision, uh, they built a solar-driven Stirling engine with Coca-Cola cans and straws. And, and she just saw these boys come alive. And they, wanted, they, they, they were fumbling with these tools. But then they, they, some of them became really good really fast. And she said, quote, boys are born tinkerers. They have a deep-seated need to rip things apart, decode their inner workings, create stuff. This professor is right. Boys, more than girls, tend to be the tinkerers, the builders, the decoders. There's a huge body of psychological literature that shows that, on average, men prefer working with things and women prefer working with people. Now, it goes without saying that there are uh, many women who would defy the stereotype of their sex and happily enter a field where they worked with, I don't know, where they were pipe fitters or mechanical engineers or metallurgists, but just, there's just not very many. They're, that's unusual to do that. Uh, the number of men eager to enter these fields is markedly greater. And just look at the workplace today. We have had nearly 40 years of gender neutral pronouns and sometimes overwhelming uh, uh, denunciations of women's traditional roles, and a lot has changed. But this hasn't changed. Men still predominate by huge numbers. Um, and, and in uh, mechanical vocations, the manual vocations, car repair, electrical engineering, drilling, oil drilling. And women are predominate in overwhelming numbers in the empathy-centered fields, as early childhood education, social work, veterinary medicine, pediatrics. Um, now, young men may be a, a vanishing breed on our college campus, but there are a few schools um, in this country who have no trouble attracting them at all. These are schools whose names include these four letters, T-E-C-H. Georgia Tech, 68% male. Rochester Institute of Technology, 69%. South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, 74%. Embry Riddle Aeronautical, 85%. If we want to narrow the education gap, and we want to help our economy and help young men, we should be doing everything we can to help them become the tinkerers, the builders, the aviation mechanics, the engineers, the techies, so many of them want to be. And as it turns out, Harvard University recently came up with a plan. Uh, there's a report called Pathways to Prosperity. And at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, they looked at the, at the workplace and they looked at our schools and they saw this yawning gap opening up between boys and, and girls, favoring, favoring the girls. And they said, quote, our system clearly does not work very well, especially for young men. And they call for a national revival of vocational education in secondary schools, not to go back to voc ed in the, I don't know, 50s and 60s, when sometimes it was just a place to put poorly performing students. They cite a model in Massachusetts called the Cadillac of, it's no, we don't longer say vocational education, we call it career training and education. 
And Massachusetts has a system that should be studied by anybody that wants to improve their, their educational system because at these schools, the kids, boys and girls, do get a serious education and they, many of them do go on to college. However, they spend a good deal of their time apprenticing in fields of, that interest them. They, computer repair, heating, refrigeration, cosmetology. They are working wonders with girls. A lot of the kids that go to them are academically disengaged and, and, now, and these schools have fantastic graduation rates. But it's nothing short of a miracle what's happening with the boys. So today in Massachusetts, these technical schools, you can read about it in Pathways to Prosperity, it's online. These schools are launching pads into the middle class. That's what we need. Now you would say, so why wouldn't we do that? It's so obvious. I mean, boys seem to want to have more, and girls too. And the girls go to these schools as well, but they're really great for boys. It seems win-win, except there are obstacles about helping boys. Uh, the first thing is that many uh, women's groups, sadly, they see efforts to help boys as part of a backlash against girls. And um, if you look at, uh, take career and technical education, there's a group called the National Council on Women and Girls in Education, NCWGE. I'll just call it the Council. This is a consortium of groups that include the American Association of University Women, the National Organization for Women, the National Women's Law Center, Ms. Foundation, the NEA. These, this group, this council, these are heavy hitters. They have condemned high school uh, career and technical education programs as hotbeds of sex segregation. And they, after one report after another, they deplore the fact that, not that girls aren't there, girls are there but they're not studying the same thing as the boys. And that's what's upsetting this, the council, this women's council. Quote, girls are largely absent from traditional male courses. There are only 4% of heating and refrigeration, 5% of welding. Uh, that tells me I'm almost done. At the same time, they account for 90% of the students enrolled in cosmetology, childcare, and healthcare fields. Such enrollment patterns, they say, reflect the persistence of sex stereotyping and sex discrimination. Now because of successful lobbying over years, these women's groups have had enormous influence on career and technical education. And if you go to one of these schools, you'll find the teachers, as one of them said, this is almost all we think about. They could lose their funding from Washington if they don't have enough kids going over into non-traditional fields. It's not just that you, I think it's fine to encourage boys to be cosmetologists if they want to be, and girls to be welders, but guess what? They, most of them refuse. So you have to have very aggressive, and, then you, it, and they just haven't made much progress. I don't want to say they haven't made any progress, but overall, they, that, that division that I, I discussed in the beginning, it just seems to be there. It just seems men and women aren't alike, and that our educational system, just as we, we, we fail if we don't change our classrooms to meet the needs of boys, if we don't realize that the workplace, the career interests of boys and girls are not identical. And these groups, they have uh, convinced Congress now for a long time that you know, the schools have to put a, a tremendous energy into what they call their non-traditionals, their non-trads. There is a non-trad empire that is inconceivable. I mean, just I went online, I have, it, it, you cannot describe how much effort goes into this and, and now the women's groups are even angrier. They just sent out uh, the, 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 this Perkins is a bill. We spend $1.1 billion helping career and technical programs. And they want a major focus to be this persistent problem of you know, too few girls having uh, opportunities in, in fields that most they seem not to be interested in. I think instead of spending millions of dollars on the dubious effort of transforming an aspiring cosmetologist into a welder, uh, we should concentrate on helping young people, male and female, enter careers that interest them. And right now, it is boys who are the new underserved population. It is boys who require the attention. But here's the problem in a nutshell, and then I'll subside. Uh, historically, women were the second sex. They did suffer discrimination. So we have a, a women's lobby that developed 
And now it is very elaborate, it is very powerful, it is ubiquitous. There are women's groups everywhere in Washington, in every state, in every municipality. And these groups work ceaselessly to protect and promote what they see as female interests. Even the slightest possibility of harm, a girl not uh, getting enough encouragement for, for, for a, uh, to become a, a pipe fitter. Uh, that becomes the object of massive attention, activism, legal maneuvers. Well, we've got to stop this. We've got to put more attention into making our classrooms amenable to boys. We've got to acknowledge the boy gap the way they're doing in Britain and England and, and, and I mean, in uh, Great Britain and Canada and Australia. And, and I will end with this. Um, a professor at the University of Maine, she was the head of the Women's Center, and she learned that in Maine, boys had fallen behind and they were not going to college and they weren't in any of the rankings of in the top 10 rankings of anything and she said well you know it's kind of ironic a few years into a disparity between men and women and everybody says oh my god we really need to look at this the world is going to end and she resented the fact that for so many years women were the second sex in college women were on a back burner and nobody protested and now that so she seems to be saying maybe now it's just it's girls turn to shine. Now, uh, I think this is understandable if you view the world that way, but I think it's very misguided. It was wrong to ignore women's educational needs for so long and cause for celebration when we began to meet those needs. But turning the table and neglecting boys is not the answer. Why not be fair to both? The rise of women, however long under, overdue, does not require the fall of men. Thank you. Can you take some questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to do a question and answer period now. If you'd like to ask a question, please come forward over here and we'll ask some questions. Come on up. Don't be shy. to agree with some, much of what you said, um, and I talk a lot about the policies that have had a disparate impact on boys, like the, the decline of recess, the zero tolerance policies, uh, a free play of children. They've replaced, um, okay. they've replaced games like uh, tag with something called circle of friends. This is promoted by the uh, publication by the National Education Association. It's a game of tag where no one is ever out and, and tug of war has been replaced with tug of peace. Uh, this kind of thing, which it speak, I mean, probably is alienating to a lot of little girls as well, but really bad for boys. So I agree that these are, these are phenomenon are going on in schools. And um, 
I agree also that it's, it's families. But the problem is, it's true that the family disintegration is harming especially the boys. But where do we start to solve the problem? And I think it, if ver if some things are out of our control. But this is something we could control. We could make our classrooms happier places for little boys. And the schools that I studied most were boys' schools and girls, some girls' schools, where they were able to tailor their teaching methods to the interests and needs of boys. And that's where I saw such enormous success. And the others, as I studied these um, technical high schools, I went to a school called Aviation High in New York City. I went out to some seemingly, I don't know, it was this gritty section of Queens. I thought I was lost. There, were the, there was the, it, this horrible building. It was the school. And I went inside and found one of the most inspiring places in, in the country. <laughs> it was 2,000 kids studying at this technical high school. And it was just like the schools in Massachusetts, but this was in New York. And these kids weren't merely engaged, they were enthralled. Now it was 87% boys. There were girls there. Uh, and they're doing great, and they like it, but they know they're different. And across the river in, in uh, Manhattan, there's a, a New York City fashion industry school, and that's 98% girls. And, uh, but uh, bo both of these schools have high academic expectations. Many of the kids go on to college. But here's the thing, those boys, and, and at, at Aviation High, a lot of them came from broken homes and poor families, mostly uh, Hispanic and, and African American and Asian kids. But in those schools, they, kids who might have been disaffected or, or had every risk of academic failure, they were so interested in what they were doing, they put up with the academic demands because they wanted to work on the Cessna 411 that was parked out in the playground. And you couldn't get to that if you didn't do this. So th those kids would work very hard on academics because it had a purpose. And boys, believe me, you have to show them a purpose. And they had one. So I'm just saying there are a lot of things we could be doing. There are problems we can't solve, but these we, we could. You touched on this a little bit in your last answer, but my question is about single-sex education. Um, I'm wondering if the, if, do we have data to show that single-sex education is good for both girls and boys? Because I graduated from single-sex education, and the, this was years ago, but the, the wisdom then was it's good for girls, but it's better for boys to be in with girls. So I'd like to know, is there data that shows that boys do better in single-sex education? Are we accumulating that data now? And secondly, are we beginning to see any kind of experimentation in charter schools, public charter schools, in um, single-sex education for boys? Well, funny you should ask, because a, la a week, week and a half ago at the American Enterprise Institute, I had a debate with a woman named Lise Elliott. She is a neuroscientist, and she works with the AL ACLU. Uh, well, she, she's a professor, but she, she has a group that works along with the ACLU, and they are suing single-sex schools as centers of sex segregation, and they compare it to racial segregation. Uh, and I found this uh, appalling, and said so in the debate. And I looked very carefully at the research. Now, the first thing to say is, there is a reason why wealthy people all over the world, uh, who, given the opportunity, many of them have chosen single-sex schools for their sons and daughters. So there is a tradition of excellence. So no one can deny that students have had a great education and that there are many fine institutions. But the question is, people, people critics will say, but that's not because they're single-sex. That's because these, these schools are privileged. They have great faculty. They have, and the single-sex doesn't make a difference. And they will say there is no evidence that shows that just separating the genders. Now, I would probably agree just separating the genders might not be enough. But, that, but the thing is, most schools don't only do that. They separate them, and then they, they play to their strengths and their interests. And so we've got lots of data on some fantastic programs. Uh, in in, in uh, Texas, Dallas, Texas, they had an Irma Rangel Leadership School for Girls. And now they've opened, a, a, and these are for inner city kids, and, and, but they run it like an elite uh, private girls' school and private boys' school. They have a private school for boys. And the boys wear, uh, th these are kids that are, 
the, the 240 boys and the parents came all over the state trying to get their kids. And it's, this isn't even a charter school, it's a magnet school, it's right, a public school. But it's a boys school and they wear blazers, the boys, and everything is a competition. The headmaster, this brilliant man, he, he broke the, the school up into houses and everything is done for points for your team and he finds that boys will do anything for their team. And uh, it, it, it's fantastic. One other quick example, in uh, West Virginia, a school, the boys were really far behind. They separated the classes and they, this, this brilliant teacher who just loved working with boys implemented a game called Battle of the Books. You had to read a book and your team and then you had to go and compete and they started reading like mad and the, they, at one point the um, sixth grade boys, all boys class beat the eighth grade co-ed class in Battle of the Books and, the, and to the teacher's amazement the boys asked for extra books over the summer. She said, this is uh, a first in the history of, of West Virginia that <laughs> this happened. But guess what? There's not a, I don't have a happy ending because the ACLU got it shut down. Now, you'll wonder, like, why would they do this? What is going on? Well, we have these gender scholars in our university who are persuaded that the sex difference is an artificial cultural imposition and we, best left behind. And that just as we transcended, or, you know, organizing people according to race, we must now do it for gender. And this is what she insisted. I, and I went to the website of uh, Professor Elliot. She and six other neuroscientists and psychologists, they have this notion in their heads, this, this idée fixe, the French would call it. it and this idea, they have a, a website and the, a teacher. A teacher can go and take a test to see how advanced and in inclusive she is. And if you say, good morning, boys and girls, or ladies and gentlemen, put away your pencils, that is bad. You wouldn't say, good morning, blacks and Latinos and whites. That's what they say. They compare that. I mean, it's so absurd because ra when you separate by race, you are, uh, the, the motives are bad. People did it out of a toxic attitude and hatred, and the outcomes were horrible. If you separate by sex, it's done by good motives to help kids, and the outcomes are wonderful. Now, one final word, the, the research on sex education. If, can, we, can we prove that if you separate it? No, it's mixed. If you look at the research, the Department of Education did a fabulous survey uh, uh, in 2005, and what they found is just a, 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 a mix of inconsistent findings. But before you use that to conclude, well, then maybe we shouldn't study, you know, we shouldn't pursue single sex. It turns out this is true of a lot of things in education. If you try to prove that it's good to have, you would think small classes, what could be easier to prove? Well, that turns out to be as controversial among researchers as small schools, big schools, big classes, small classes. Should we take kids on field trips or give them piano lessons? You could find researchers that say, don't do that, you know. So in the end, the Department of Education said, this might not even be resolvable by research. It, it's more of a philosophy, so we recommend tolerance. And so the Department of Education said okay, the Supreme Court has said okay, but the ACLU, the feminist litigators say no, and they're shutting down programs because it's not that they win if they go to court, but they scare schools who can't afford the litigation. Thank you. I wonder, uh if you would care to comment on whether you see um, a linkage between the poor performance of boys and the strong emphasis on homosexuality, which has crept into the culture or rushed into the culture, however you want to look at it. Um, I'm thinking about the Boy Scouts, and I, I won't elaborate, I'll let you. Yeah, I get. <clears throat> Okay, I, I haven't seen that as, um, I, I think just for most kids in most classrooms, it's not an issue. I mean, it's a big, it's a topical issue for adults, but I think in the schools, I see it less. And I, again, I don't know what, if it's had an impact. I'm a big girl. <laughs> I am a girl. Um, thank you very much for the information. I sort of have you triggered one question in my mind when you mentioned the national security issue. 
um, but it was from an economic standpoint with boys. And I'm thinking more in terms of the military. And I served eight years in the Marine Corps in the Army. I was an officer in the Marine Corps. And I noticed certain things cannot be forced. There are gender distinctions. And as boys have been constantly over-medicated, I think, or over-diagnosed with Ritalin, you can't get them into the military anymore. Um, so I think there's a logical trajectory that this movement of there are no differences between men and women, therefore they can do the same jobs. They can, we make policy based on the pathology or the aberration and not the rule. And that is coming down into actual military doctrine. I'm concerned about that. And the other one had to be why it's more of a, a question I have as a mother of two boys. Why do I need the government to tell me the vocation of my child when I observe him every day and I see his bent or his interest and he may be more academically driven or the other one may be more of a wing nut, hammer and guns kind of kid. But I don't need experts at the PhD level to tell me what takes place at the lowest level transaction center. That's mom, dad, and the kid. Thank you. Well, I didn't even talk about Ritalin, but um, this is some uh, social critics and who are boy advocates will say that we're just we've medicated boyhood, that that's how we've we've coped. The schools moved away from strict discipline, so they 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 turn to medication. It's a little bit of an overstatement. I do think there are some boys that need this medication, but a very small percentage compared to how many for whom it's prescribed. Almost even most psychiatrists would probably agree it is over-prescribed. Uh, this is medication for hyperactivity, attention deficit disorders, and it uh, affects far more boys than girls. Something like 75% of the kids who are medicated are boys. And there are some school districts, uh, you know, sort of middle class uh, school, uh, upper middle class white school districts where 20% of the boys are medicated. So that's something to worry about. Uh, but yes, the, this idea that we're weakening our young men, I think there's some truth to that. That if they, if they are made to be ashamed of their uh, high-spiritedness and their rambunctiousness, males are, on average, greater risk-takers, more competitive. And what a teacher and a parent, a, a school leader needs to do is to find a way to channel that towards positive ends. And then it's the greatest force the, the cultural and, and social and economic that there could be. But what we're doing is kind of tampering them down and holding them back and I think shaming boys far too often. I have uh, two boys going to kindergarten this year and uh, just looking for some advice on what I can do, what suggestions I can give to the teacher, or what kind of indicators I need to look for from the teacher to help my boys to uh, to do well in kindergarten and down the road. What are things that we should look for and what suggestions can we give to teachers to help to mitigate this issue? Oh, it's so hard as a parent because your your child is sort of a hostage. You don't want to go ask questions that make the teacher not like you. And I've been through this. Uh, but I would, you don't, you sometimes don't have a choice um, once you're in a school, what teacher, but you do have a somewhat of a choice of what school you send them to. And I would be careful um, and make sure that there's, they allow for the, as I said, the, the rambunctiousness of little boys, that it's not a school where everyone's kind of monitored and over, you know, every little action is policed. Um, and, and I would look at the offerings, the readings, because the, the, the books that interest boys are, tend to be somewhat different from what interests girls, starting as early as kindergarten. Uh, and, and most importantly, does the teacher like boys if, if she has an antipathy? Now, by the way, I think most teachers do like boys and want to do their best, but they're not given direction. If they've been to a school of education, chances are they're still reading that girls are shortchanged victims in our school. We're still like MSNBC, patriarchal oppressive society. They still think that way. And so they're taught not to be attentive to boys, and, and they're not taught that the sexes are different. They're taught they're the same, and we should try to get them to be more alike, which really means we should try to get boys to be more like girls, because girls are the gold standard in the school. And what you want to find is a, a school where there can be two gold standards, <laughs> uh, male and female. And finally, the last thing I'll say is um, if your kid is, or your child, or 
a friend of yours has a child who's in trouble. I, I do have a friend who, whose little boy, I mean, even I thought he was a handful when he would come around, um, and people wanted to put him on Ritalin, and, and I don't even, that wasn't even good. They, they had all sorts of drugs. And, but through circumstances that are too complicated to explain, she, ha, she sent him to a boys' school. That seemed to have taken pl the place of all of these <laughs> medications. It was almost as if the, the school itself gave him structure, organization, what to expect. There were authority figures, and he's flourished. So that, that's why I'm very um, much in favor of having more opportunities for all-male academies and boys' schools in our public schools. But you've got the ACLU to contend with, so I don't know if we'll get that. Is there research that suggests a correlation between the suppression of rough and tumble play and the proliferation of violent video games? Oh, no, <laughs> not that connection. There's a lot of literature about the video games. And again, you can, the, re, the research is not consistent. It's uh, just a, a kind of uh, a, a confusing tangle of inconsistent findings. Um, but the suppression of rough and tumble play, I think that is more associated with obesity and with the, the just health. I mean, look, our ki these kids, especially boys, want to run around like mad. And it's good for them. It's good for their health. It, I mean, within reason. I'm not saying that boys have to become gentlemen. They have to learn through good sportsmanship and so forth. But, they, but why not let them have as much activity as they want, given the, the health benefits and so forth? But the connection between the two would be interesting to study. <laughs> Dr. Summers, I'm actually asking this for someone who had to leave. A study hall teacher asked that are there any tips or ideas that you can present to boys that have to be quiet during study hall, but how can you engage them intellectually and stimulate them so that they actually do pay attention and learn something in study hall? Well, what I will say is that good teaching is as is, is much art as, so probably more art than science. And, uh, but a good teacher for boys is if we are to go by, again, he bringing up the British and the Australians and what they found, is that you, you do need to have, I don't know about study hall, you don't really teach in study hall, do you? They just have to sit and work. So I don't know how to, I always thought study hall was kind of a waste of time when I was, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not, they don't think they should have study hall, but um, I don't know what to do with anybody in study hall, but I will say in the typical classroom, if you want to get their interests, um, we're, they're trying everything in Britain there, and, and some of the teachers, even for, uh, I, I read about one classroom where they don't have desks. The kids stand up, they, and while they're learning like their math facts or something, they're throwing a ball around, and someone said, well, where are the desks? Why don't they sit down? And they said, well, you know, eight-year-old boys, if they sit down, they go, their brains turn off. They, you know, they, they space out. They keep them up. They keep them. And then their tests and their scores and their teams. And, you know, I mean, we should be trying all of these things. And, and instead, we're very much in the opposite direction. But, yeah. Just, um, mainly, Dr. Summer, I want to thank you from my heart because, I, I mean, where have you been all my life? You know, I had my son, uh, we had our three girls and I had a boy 10 years ago and 11 years ago. And it wasn't until he was born and he started manifesting all these wonderful male traits that I never even, I, I finally realized. Um, the first was that my girls were playing with a dollhouse and they brought him over to the dollhouse and he proceeded to line up all the dolls and catapult them off the roof, you know? <laughs> and that was my first entry. And so I started really, you know, delving into that. But I, I found that the weapons are not, and I, I would say this to parents when they're getting criticized for the boys with the weapons, they're not being evil or murdering, they're defending. Their, their innate sense is to defend others, especially their family. Um, the second thing is my, I have a complaint about, I'm sorry to say this, the Boy Scout camp we went to last year had women on bullhorns directing the activities. Okay, so, okay, that's my, my little complaint. And then my third thing is that I want to give a quote of um, a mystic who once said that uh, men and women are so different, it is, it, it is as if their very souls are different. And then the, the, the last thing I want to say is um, there are two books that, that saved my marriage because it, they made me realize that there is a difference between men and women. I grew up in the 70s, 
and I was absolutely taught that there's really no difference, you know. And um, it started causing real trouble in my life until I found two very old books, and um, they were written in the 60s by a husband and wife. They, they, there was one written for women. It was called Fascinating Womanhood, and the author is a woman named Helen Andelin, A-N-D-E-L-I-N. -E the entire book is about how to understand your husband because he is radically different from you. Um, and for, for a very good reason. And then the last thing was um, Aubrey Andelin, her husband, wrote Man, Man of Steel and Velvet. And it was the same thing about how men can survive in a world that is really being overtaken by women. So thank you from my heart for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, just one thing. Your comments reminded me of a, a, a wonderful study from the University of Pennsylvania. Some psychologists uh, wanted to look at why, why don't boys, uh, oh, oh, no, here's what they were studying. A lot of, remember in the beginning I told you there are some educators that want to help boys by making them more like girls and they're, you know, rescue them from this toxic masculinity. And it's supposed to be this terrible thing that boys are ashamed of their feelings, they won't talk about them, and you have to you know, like sit them in circles and draw them out and so forth. Well, these uh, research scientists at the University of Pennsylvania actually interviewed a huge cross-section of, of boys, like junior high and seventh, eighth, ninth grade boys, and asked them, uh, are you afraid to talk about your feelings? No. Are you embarrassed? No. They, they found not a trace of embarrassment. So why don't you do it? And the boys over and over gave, gave two reasons. It's a waste of time, and it's weird. <laughs> and, and, and so she, what she found was sometimes boys do have problems, but they also have kind of a natural stoicism, and they don't want to dwell on it. And, it, and there is something uh, in, you know, sort of psychically protective of that male quality. That you could say maybe women need a little bit of it, because women do the opposite. We tend to ruminate. and over and over, we want to talk about it endlessly, and girls do. But what they found is girls feel better when they talk about problems at length with a best friend, or something. and guys just feel like, oh God, that was a waste of time. And so what they say is if you want to talk about a boy, with a boy, you've got to show him that it's, there's a problem to be solved, that it, there's something practical. You've got to get that, you know, that little tool tinkerer that, that you're going to accomplish something very concrete otherwise. But long-winded answer to this thing about men and women, this is a fundamental misunderstanding. And now you have all these people that want to get boys to be more emotive, pour out their feelings in journals. And I, I, I just remember one time my son came to me, Mom, what do I do? And I looked at this assignment, and it was all about his emotional reaction. They had read a text that had some curse words. So it said, how did you respond to the cursing? How did it make you feel? Did it make you feel embarrassed? Did it make you to feel inhibited, a bit worse about yourself? But, and, and you were going to get graded on how sort of developed your answer. And he had just written, how do you feel when you hear, he went, fine. Does it make you feel bad? No, it does not. Do, you know, that was it. <laughs> but then I thought, why are they asking him this? I mean, I don't know why you would ask anybody these questions. But anyway, the fact is, these are the differences. And teachers have to know it and not punish boys for being uh, the little stoics that many of them are. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, these will be our last two questions for the evening. We're running short on time, so we'll go ahead and ask these questions. Uh, do you have any comments on Common Core education, that, that central planning, and how it would affect your these issues? I'm a little bit worried about it. I haven't followed it as carefully as everybody else seems to have in my institute. I, people have very strong views. and. Uh, Here's what worries me, is that uh, when I, t I keep talking about that Harvard Graduate School Pathways to Prosperity, that was a great study. And they brought experts from all over the world, uh, leaders, and, and, and kind of um, discerned, you know, what, what's the best thing we could be doing. And there isn't just one pathway to success. There are many. And we, are, we have a model in the United States that you graduate from high school and you go to college and you know you get a BA in sociology or anthropology or site what and there are a lot of kids for whom this is not working and, and but now you need education beyond high school but a lot of kids especially a lot of boys would like a high school maybe to go to a charter school like aviation high or an automotive high or something that interests him go there and girls there are a lot of, of subjects they would enjoy where you take partly academic and partly 
uh, these vocational courses. But if we set these very high academic standards for everybody, there's not going to be room for that kind of uh, creative innovation. And right now, uh, the, the biggest threat to career and technical education isn't even the, uh, the, uh, the, all these women's groups. It's that there's, they keep upping the ante and, and having statewide requirements that all kids meet these very high standards. And so there's just no time in the day for children to pursue another course. So I, I honestly want to see more variety in our schools, more charter schools, more magnet schools, the voucher programs where parents could go to the sort of school that they want. So I'm not sure that coming from on high and imposing a single standard is going to, certainly I don't think it's going to be that helpful to boys. However, I'm not set on this opinion. I just don't yet know enough about what it's really going to mean. This will be our last question for the evening. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, I'm a fifth grade teacher with a class of mostly boys, and so I wanted to touch on the, um, the idea of the active classroom because I um, totally understand the importance of it, but it's difficult to manage, and as far as like distinguishing between like rough and tumble play, but active classroom sort of scenarios, and specifically like when those things are appropriate, and how to, um, this is a huge question of course, um, but how to maintain that structure that's necessary in a traditional classroom that is teacher-led versus, you know, a Montessori school where it would be different because it's student-led. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just brought up that class where they were they didn't have desks because it was so different and I think it would take a very diff special kind of teacher that could manage it, so I'm not uh, recommending that. But I, what I do recommend is um, you can find them online now because they, they, they're not really coming out of schools of education, but there are boy advocates that have begun to publish lists of bo books, boy enthralling books, books that no boy can resist. Uh, at different grade levels. I would check that out. I would also look at um, a, a website called, the, it's, it's actually called the White House Council for Boys and Men. Uh, it has nothing to do with the White House, but there is a White House Council for Women and Girls because girls are supposedly behind in education and the women's groups immediately lobbied uh, President Obama to establish that. And so a group of uh, academics and um, uh, student advocates and education leaders came together and said, well, they should have a, a, a council for boys. But if you go to that website, there are a lot of resources, information, responsible data. It's bipartisan. It's, it's just it's a very, very intelligently uh, arranged, managed uh, site. And, um, and finally, I, you might want to look at books by Leonard Sachs. Leonard Sachs is a great uh, patron of single-sex education. And he, the, the ACLU, is, their war is really against him because he thinks boys and girls are very different, not in their intelligence or their aptitude, but in their, what motivates them. He believes that it's just very different. What, and so he has um, developed elaborate ideas on how to motivate boys and girls, which are, I mean, I read them, and if, if my teacher had done the things he said, but for example, to get a girl to love, um, physics or engineering, it may sound sexist, but you have to show her how it helps people. You have to make a connection. You have to, I mean, if you can uh, channel that, that empathy that is so powerful in so many girls, uh, th then you, you could have a, a, a budding engineer. And so Leonard Sachs is very good about developing those techniques for girls to strengthen them. But then for boys, how do you get them hooked on reading? Or how do you get them to care about school, you know, and Sachs has ideas, so that, that's my final suggestion. Great. How do you spell Sachs? S-A-X, Leonard Sachs. Uh, Leonard Sachs, uh, I think he has a book, Boys Adrift, and several books about single-sex education. Thank you so much. Let's show our appreciation to Dr.